Hi everyone, I'm Eugene Driscoll. Welcome to Valley Naval Gazing on WNHH 103.5 FM and on valleyindie.org and on SoundCloud. I don't even know where else we are. iTunes. Libsyn. That's the one. I can never remember what that was. And that's uh, Ethan Fry. I'm not sure Fry. if I'm pronouncing it correctly either, but we'll see. Yeah, you're a little muted. You're a little muted on there. That might, I might have to adjust that myself. But uh, yeah, that's my co-host, Ethan Fry. Hello, Ethan. Hello, how are you? <laughs> So uh, today is what? It's Friday, November something or other. 11th. 11th. Uh, November 11th. It's Veterans Day. Yes, Veterans how Day. stupid of me. So a great day. We, we're going to talk about, this is the first podcast we've done since the election, which uh, was November 8th. You may or may not be aware. Uh, and in the studio making, in the studio, like this is a studio, I apologize, but uh, in the Valley Indy office in Ansonia making his regular monthly appearance, it's Seymour First Selectman, Kurt Miller. Hello, hello, hello. Kurt, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. And then making a first appearance on our podcast, although technically you have asked questions via Facebook, is uh, Ansonia's Tarek Rosland. Hello. And did I just say your, after I asked you a hundred times how to say your first name, yep. I messed it up. Tarek Rosland. Tarek yep. Rosland. So thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you very much. So generally, I mean, you know, it's been a really busy week here at the Valley Indy. Uh, I don't have anything prepared. I don't have much of a script, but I thought we would talk about first uh, the state races here. I mean, one thing that I noticed uh, this week in the Valley is that, uh, you know, suddenly the Valley got some attention uh, this yes. week mm. uh, because uh, something like 59 percent of the Valley, according to our reporting from late Tuesday, or <coughs> early Wednesday, uh, voted for Donald Trump. And we had two upsets, I think, upsets uh, in the state races. Uh, that being uh, Nicole Claritas Dietria, up in your neck of the words, was mm -hmm. uh, 105th. Defeated incumbent Teresa Conroy. And then George Logan pulling out a victory over longtime Democratic incumbent uh, Senator Joe Crisco. Uh, so I want to know, uh, as you uh, first select with Miller, what are some takeaways uh, from this week in terms of those state races? What, what, what have we learned? Well, I think we've seen that the people of Connecticut are not overly pleased with the direction of the state of Connecticut. I think a lot of their frustration with the governor, unfortunately, was put upon some of these state senators and state reps, whether uh, due or not. But I think that's the biggest takeaway with the state Senate now being 18-18. Uh, so there's a, a tie there, uh, obviously broken by the lieutenant governor. And then the House, more importantly, being closed now to 79 to 72, I believe is the number. So I think you're going to see a little bit more balance now in Hartford. Uh, hopefully that will be a positive thing. I think that's what the, uh, the people are looking for. I think they're quite tired of the business as usual that we've seen, unfortunately, over the last you know, eight years or so. And what do you think it could mean for Seymour specifically with a new state rep uh, up your way? Uh, well, I think it'll be Which a little bit different. De your, your she's deputy, yep, first she's a deputy for a select woman. Uh, I, I believe she called you a mentor in uh, maybe her, was it her speech that night? I think we reported that uh, you're her mentor. So Yeah, we've been, uh, Nicole and I have been friends since we were kids. So uh, she was new to politics when she came on board, the board of selectmen, but she was like a sponge. She just kept absorbing knowledge and learning new things and asking questions. And you know, she's actually been very good for me because she's been pushing me to do uh, different things, which is which is great. But you know, I think there's going to be a little bit of a, a small loss initially. I mean, Representative Conroy did do a nice job in bringing money back to Seymour. I can't take that away from her. But Seymour is fortunate to be covered by two state senators, Senator Kane and Senator Kelly, both and re -elected to both reelected by, um, by big, big, margins. big margins. So I think that's going to benefit uh, Seymour directly because of the state, the uh, Senate, excuse me, now being 1818. I think that's going to give them a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more power, a little bit more authority. So I, I expect that uh, Seymour really won't miss a beat and will continue to be receiving what we have been in the past and hopefully a little bit more. And do you think uh, on the state level, or at least in the Valley, uh, the, the, was it, did Donald Trump have coattails locally, or is it more, is the win uh, more attributable to uh, Governor Malloy's uh, lack of popularity here? I think Nicole would have won either way. To be quite honest with you, um, you know the reception that the doors that she received, she knocked uh, close to six thousand doors, which is incredible. Um, very positive with the people. I think the message that she put out was positive. I think the governor, the tying of Teresa Conroy to the governor, I think was very impactful. So I think she would have won anyway. 
But when I tell you there's people that I have never seen before in my life that were showing up to vote, I'm, I'm not kidding. There's people I've never seen before just rolling in. Now, generally in Seymour, and you've covered a lot of our elections and things, you know, on, on a very good uh, municipal election, if we get 4,000 people, I mean, that's incredible. We were at 1,500 people at the first polling place by 11 o'clock. So just the volume of people that were showing up, and I think that's directly uh, can be directly attributed to this campaign. Now, I'm not saying they were all there for Donald Trump. I'm sure there was a lot of people that were first-time voters that were there to vote for Secretary Clinton as well. But, you know, when you see that many uh, pickup trucks, you know, we were kind of joking around. When big pickup trucks are coming in, they're not voting Democratic. Those are generally Republican governors. I mean, we're all kidding around. The Republican, Republicans and Democrats, we're all laughing mm-hmm. about that. But, but like I said, people I'd never seen before showing up to vote, which I think is, is a great thing. But then just like I'm, I, I quickly jotted down some of the, the numbers – uh, in 2008, Teresa Conroy received uh, 6,000, about 6,100 uh, votes. And then uh, that was a presidential ele- election year. That was when President Obama was first elected. 2012, uh, she dipped down to about uh, 5,100. Yep. Uh, and then this time, uh, it was just under 5,000. Meanwhile, uh, Claritas Dietria this time out got 6,589. So in terms of Seymour, that's a pretty uh, significant uh, victory. Absolutely. You, and g- were you confident going into it? Did you were you noticing that Conroy seemed her vote total was going the other way walking into this? You know, we we study the numbers. Um, you know, we've already analyzed these numbers to start preparing for the municipal election in in 2017, and I think any prudent person is going to do that. Um, Are but you going to run for re-election again? By the way. Yes, <laughs> one more time. Um, but I, I think the, the fa- there was an X factor with this election that was hard to predict how many new people would be coming out, people that had never voted, people that had never registered before. And I think you saw that with a, a high turnout in absentee ballots and also a high turnout in people of same-day registration and voting for the president. So it was, I think and no one could predict... I think, with any accuracy. And I think we proved that with all the money we spend on polling. None of them were right. Except, and, oh, go ahead, good. There was well, one. Well, L.A. Poll. Times. One. Yeah, the L.A. Times. And, and you know, no, I said that because it was 44.2 right. to 44.1. And that was Wait, the only second, one that was right. I, I'm hearing this for the first time. That yeah. L.A. Times poll that was ridiculed yep. from what I was reading the whole time. Mm, yep. They would put an asterisk to be, oh, by the way, the... The weirdo L.A. Times poll mm-hmm. has... And I guess it's for- because just the... Sorry, now I'm, now I'm really loud. But the methodology, I guess, was uh, instead of calling up, you know, hundreds of random people each time, the sample always stayed... This, they asked the same people over time, and that's what made it more... Yeah. You know, there could be a, a, a revolutionary election for polling if, I mean, if that industry survives. But <laughs> of course it will. But how many people, though, were... I, 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 you know, 538. I hope that site... I hope their traffic is uh, takes a hit. I don't... I wish good upon everyone because, you know, I've never felt more irrelevant in my life than when those yeah. final results uh, came in. But wait, I, did you, go ahead. Did you want to say... Well, no, I was saying, how many people, though, didn't want to admit who they were voting for? I think a lot of people saw what was going on in the world and how people were being attacked regardless of the side you were on. And I think there's a lot of people that just kept who they were voting to f- to themselves and didn't even I, want to tell a pollster. I was at we 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 were at the polls uh, on election day, obviously, and we were we were we were working the, on the the story that was on the site uh, for all of Wednesday um, about Trump voters and just approaching people like you got the impression you know some people I approached they were like no I don't want to talk to you you know yeah. people don't like talking to reporters. I think most people just don't like that. To that begin was with, yeah. But that was yeah. We know, were having ulcers. I, I, fa- I found oh. one eventually, but uh, <laughs> you know, you got the impression, and that like you know, the the candidate himself sort of yeah. demonized the evil media. But I think you know, uh, you, I th- neither campaign was like you know, oh, the media is great, um, but we saw some things that weren't. We saw, you know, the whole Donna Brazil debate question, that yep. whole like controversy. I mean, it, it was not a, a great election for uh, people in the news business by any means. I mean, survey survey methodology is always a tricky one, I think, you know, and especially when it comes time to things like a national poll. I mean, um, 
you're talking about usually when you look at these these uh, polling, you know, I, I I took statistics. I don't understand how you can have a significant sample from a thousand people out of a okay. nation out of you know two hundred million or a hundred million voters, um, and then there's always inherent inherent survey bias when it comes to survey methodology and a lot of the things that you guys are talking about are just going to exacerbate um those biases in there so i do think and and i and i was listening to um a program talking about this and they were saying that um you know the challenge with a lot of people coming away from landlines and a lot of the the, a Mm -hmm. lot of the pollsters uh, were not adjusting their methodology to account for that. They were still relying on landline, um, still relying on landline as their contact method, and that's going to have a skew. Um, Although so we'll see if there's a transform. I think there will be a, a drastic transformation in that. We should we should point out that uh, in addition to the L.A. Times, a more accurate poll was uh, ValleyIndy.org. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. We posted. Five totally polls. unscientific, but yeah. You only missed one, I think, right? <laughs> In our area. It's <laughs> our readers correctly predicted uh, uh, four of the five yep. poll questions. They got uh, uh, George Logan over uh, Senator Crisco. They got uh, Nicole over Teresa Conroy. And both derby questions. Both derby questions. And one derby question, question one was approved. Question two was rejected. And that was a poll that I, it was in a pre-existing story. I put it in later and people still sought it out and voted and, you know, matched what, what ended up happening. So, uh, there you go. I yeah. guess we should, uh, we, we, we can get some grant money as a, as a polling thing. We'll just forget the LA times. It's the Valley Indy. Just <laughs> launch that. Anything you want to know what's going on locally. But I'm wondering if you have, if anybody has any thoughts about, uh, the upset, uh, right downstairs, literally, uh, with Senator Crisco, who was a 12th term, he was in his 12th term. We keep messing that mm. up, but uh, you know, it was uh, defeated by George Logan, who has never held a uh, public office uh, before. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on yeah. what ha- may have happened there. Yeah, definitely want to talk about that. Um, and let me just uh, y- that microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely want to talk about that. I, before I go there, I wanted to say just to, on your last point, which is um, you know the Valley Indy um, sort of quasi poll but um quasi yeah i'm just kidding uh but the fact that i think that the valley is actually you know we were talking about the valley being a pretty good bellwether potentially for the future of politics in america and you know maybe potentially as the valley goes so does the rest of of the country and you look at you know sort of there are districts like that throughout the country that manage to kind of capture that role and i think potentially we see naugatuck valley you know, becoming kind of a swing region, if you will, um, per, kind of purplish in terms of, uh, you know, how, how things have panned out. And, and I think pur- also, like, also, like, a, a region that, like, Ansonia, for instance, is traditionally Democratic, still registration right. over heavily Democratic, right. but just because of, like, the economic pain, it, you know, that's right. the, there's, yeah. the, like, that's why you see... You know, but Ansonia went for Trump, uh, albeit narrowly. Like yeah. I think, as an example of, of what you're talking about. Yeah, and that and, and another interesting point to pull out of those numbers for Ansonia, I thought, was that um, that voters were all over the ballot, hmm. which to me yeah, is fantastic. Yeah. That's a, that's amazing to me to see that. I, I, I actually love to see that because you it means that you're dealing with an electorate which is not a partisan electorate. It means that. You know, when I say you know they're they're uh, you know moving around the ballot means they're not just uh, voting across the line. All Democrats are all Republicans, and you can see that with the results in Ansonia. Clint, uh, Trump wins by a small margin, but then you see Blumenthal and Rosa DeLauro winning by mm. enormous margins. Mm-hmm. You see uh, Linda Gentile uh, winning for the uh, state representative, but then you see George Logan as a Republican coming and beating Joe Crisco. So uh, I think that's that bodes well for the town of Ansonia um, and, and, and again, going forward as potentially, you know, sort of a good bellwether. And it, it brings up the point uh, uh, and we should, I want to ask you about Senator Crisco. So don't let me forget. There is, you know, I, 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 I this is Trump land, right? We've sort of that's <laughs> that's been out there in, in the media a little bit. Uh, Trump land, Trump land. But. That's, I mean, you can't really 
you know, the Valley made news on, on, on election night for, you know, going for Trump pretty decisively uh, compared to the rest of the state. But, you know, I don't know, is there such a thing as Trump line? Because the voters were all over the place, as you just pointed out. There's no one. Yeah, it looked like. Because um, I think other people looking, you know, this is going to be on a radio station in the city of New Haven, which is heavily Democratic. Right. And there's some uh, concern and pain uh, over there. And I think they're, you know, they're looking at us like, what, who are you guys? Yeah, uh, it's, and it's, I think. Right it's, or wrong. I mean, that's. Yeah, it's a distinction that I think pans out throughout the entire country. And, um, you know, we see this phenomenon actually, and, you know, you, you sort of look at the um, election map and we sort of tend to default to this notion that there's red states and blue states in the country. And when you look at the elec election map, it's really not the case. And what you see is you see the divide actually being between cities and rural areas. Um, you can be in the reddest state in the country, in, you know, sort of Texas or Alabama or, you know, sort of places that aren't traditionally, you know, conservative Republican states. And then you look at, you know, they're sort of the cities and their metropolitan economic hubs and, you know, voting Democrat. Um, so I think, you know, and this is something I think that will be, it's worth looking at in detail and trying to understand what are the sociological and economic dynamics that are playing out to cause this kind of divide. Um, and it's happening here in, in Connecticut as well. The, de the economic dynamic of the Naugatuck Valley region is very different than that of New Haven. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, I think the, the sort of purple nature of our region kind of reflects the fact that we're not, you know, sort of as rural as, some, you know, sort of a small town in the Midwest. Um, but we have we share some of those similarities. We, we, we've seen some of that industrial economic decline here, the manufacturing decline here. But we're also at the same time in close proximity to these major metropolitan areas. And so you have people that are sort of benefiting from the services sectors of the economy, which have done uh, relatively you know, have done bet relatively better than, than, you know, those, <coughs> those sectors. But, um, yeah. No, I think you hit the, the nail on the head where the, the bigger cities have different issues, have different needs than the smaller towns in the rural areas. I mean, if you look at a state like Pennsylvania, as an example, there's such a concentration of voters in that Philadelphia County region that they can actually control, for the most part, what happens in in that state and there was a huge turnout in the more rural areas which help offset that generally big turnout in in philadelphia and i think we see the same thing here in connecticut you know t to the points that have already been made the bigger cities the hartfords the new havens the waterberries the new londons the stanfords they kind of control i think the uh the federal delegation because that's where the mass number of votes are but i think you're going to see very different um, decisions being made when it comes to more local politics, whether it be our state reps and state senators and even our mayors or first selectmen. There's substantially more Republican mayors and first selectmen than there are Democratic ones. That's Kurt Miller's phone. I was wondering. I Sorry about that. An earthquake. That was the uh, <laughs> chief of police in Seymour. A new so. train coming or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but Is I, I mean, coming to Waterbury. Oh, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? We'd all like that. Yeah, there you go. But you know, I, I think you, you you know you hit the the nail on the head with that. Um, you know, people are going to vote for what specifically affects them and what their needs are and where they are at that that time. And I think that makes it very difficult to sometimes understand why, you know, Donald Trump wins, um, you know, this area, yet Rosa DeLora and Senator Blumenthal win hands down. It just sometimes it doesn't, doesn't the make same, sense. Yeah, in the same area. But then again, some of the arguments, I think, are are counter to that when people will say that anyone who voted for Donald Trump is a racist and a bigot and everything else, yet in this area they elected an African-American man to serve in the Senate for the first time. Mm -hmm. so, and that's George Logan. That's George Logan. So sometimes I, I, it just doesn't make any sense. And let's talk about uh, uh, George Logan and uh, Joe Crisco for a moment. Uh, what... Was that a surprise? Was that something that you saw uh, coming? I mean, from, from a reporter's perspective, it was sort of a quiet race for us. I right. mean, we don't really cover state politics, mm. but we got a ton of uh, letters mm -hmm. uh, for the other races, for, for yep. Gentile and Theresa Conroy races. Uh, but we didn't really, I had to scramble 
the over the weekend before the election to put something together to preview that race o- other than our podcast. Yeah. So what's your take on that one? You know, knowing um, both men, I've always found uh, Senator Crisco to be a great guy, very respectful, very polite. Um, I think he's done a lot of good over the many years that he's served uh, in the Connecticut legislature and, you know, his previous to that, the things that he's done. But I think people were looking for change, particularly in this area. I think we saw that in the city of Ansonia. Highly democratic uh, community now suddenly has switched to putting a Republican mayor in uh, by very large amounts over the last two elections. And Crisco um, lost Ansonia last time around, right, Ethan? Yeah, and yeah his, narrowly yeah, to, to Phil Tripp. Trip. Yeah, but I so think his, his, his support was eroding, it seemed. Right, over time. And you know, I think people truly were looking for change. Uh, I think... The people of the Connecticut identify the problems of the state of Connecticut. I think they realize that they're going to be better suited by putting business people in these key positions to help make these decisions. I think George Logan fit that to a T. I think that's why a lot of people got behind him. I mean, he's extremely articulate. He's yep. extremely intelligent. Uh, he, he's the, just and a he, good guy. His challenge in terms of na- name recognition was really uh, something. I mean, yeah. going against uh, no, the, the, there's something in the CT Mer today on, on Veterans Day it was on this morning where there's talk that, well, what happened was, you know, there was this money pouring into the race. And that's what uh, cost someone like a Chris, a Crisco his seat because of this influx of well outside money. You know, and I've heard that a lot. And that's kind of across the state. Uh, you know, some people did get involved, but it wasn't just in one party. Uh, you know, the unions play a very large role a lot of times in democratic campaigns and while it may not be uh, a direct contribution of one person writing a check for ten thousand dollars or one person uh, gearing a super PAC to go a a different way the unions are very helpful with not only financial support but phone call banks Mm -hmm. um, you know getting out the vote initiatives so to be honest with you I, I don't I don't think that is I think that's an excuse to be quite honest with you, you think it nets out, and you know, I do. Yeah, I really do. I mean, I I did see an article. I can't remember who put it out, but um, I guess before I go there, I want to say that um, George Logan. Um, I want to give him credit in terms of the way he's presented himself as a candidate. Um, uh, I saw his interview coming on here, and talking about the importance of uh, you know sort of running as a nonpartisan candidate. I think we need to see a lot more of that. I think um, that uh, that the partisan nature of our politics is very destructive to our country at this point. And I think that uh, if we can see a generation of politicians coming through that, I mean, at the moment, unfortunately, it's still a necessary evil, I think. Um, but there are a lot of problems with with uh, with part the the party system and the way it's playing out in our democracy, um, and I, I just give you know credit to to George Logan as um, you know, sort of bucking that trend and, and sort of uh, you know sort of being a leader as far as that's concerned. Um, he ran I think he ran a, a, a strong candidacy. I think uh, all of those things that uh, Kurt Miller. I said I had an opportunity to hear him speak. I never met him uh, personally, um, but uh, you know he is he is speaking effectively to the concerns of the uh, of of the people here. And um, and I think yeah that you know if you do that correctly you 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 will uh, you will win. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting to note that uh, an article did come out. Showing that you had a pack that was backed by Walmart and the and the Koch brothers, getting involved in a local state senate seat, um, you know I don't know what that means and, and potentially and we've seen we've seen that kind of um, that kind of involvement from these large national players in local elections like that across the country mm-hmm. on both sides, um, you know I guess that's the nature of uh, sort of Citizens United. Um, manifesting, you know, mm-hmm. in, in our in our politics. Yeah, that the, I was surprised. The one thing that you know, Ethan and I we did we did about six hours worth of, of podcasts with the candidates. Uh, I, I think next time, I think we'll have both people in here at the same time. I think that's one thing that's that we learned. And then let's not do mm. it until after their nasty mailers come out at the mm. very end. Because <laughs> one thing that happened was 
<laughs> you know, the podcast for the podcast, I think at some points we found ourselves, uh, you know, reaching for questions because mm-hmm. we wanted to uh, fill 50 minutes. We didn't want to do 30. Uh, and then I got at my door, like, wait, George Logan's a lobbyist. Wait a second. You know, all these things that were not said during the actual podcast uh, interview. But I guess that's mm. that's uh, normal. Uh, we should I, we should talk maybe for a, a second. We did. Uh, it was on Saturday before the election. We found ourselves sort of in the uh, crosshairs of uh, Kurt Miller and and the Republicans. Well, not really Kurt Miller, but we had. Did you do you see it? We Kevin Rennie, Kevin Rennie, a columnist for the Hartford Current. Mm-hmm. He, he runs a blog called what, Daily Ructions, I think mm, it's called. Yeah, yeah. He pointed out uh, something that we had missed, and we were in the room when we interviewed uh, Senator Crisco. Uh, the first question we asked him was basically, you know, you, the, the Republicans say you voted for uh, the two largest tax increases in the, in the history of the state. And uh, he answered by saying something along the lines of, well, those didn't those actually didn't happen. They weren't brought to the floor, something something like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, we, we didn't ask a follow up question. Uh, and, and just uh, we had J.R. Romano on our Facebook page. That Saturday, uh, taking you know, calling us out for it, and uh, you know, I th- <laughs> my immediate thought. Well, first of all, I saw the the blog uh, post the night before on Friday, and my heart sank because I listened to that part. I was like, oh yeah, that's a. I don't know why we didn't follow up on that question. We just let it go, and I kind of replayed the moment uh, in my head. Uh, and then my second thought was, man, it took the Republicans three weeks to find this, mm. <laughs> and I thought like, wow, why'd we you know th- those. Those podcasts did uh, get good traffic, at least for yep. us. Uh, mm-hmm. We put them uh, on YouTube to make them more accessible. Uh, we put them on Facebook directly to make them more accessible because if we, 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 we put them to YouTube and then downloaded them as a video and then put them on Facebook to reach more people to sort of game Facebook a little bit because they like videos more than, than anything else. But mm-hmm. just to briefly, I, I don't even know if I should go into to briefly explain what actually happened was when uh, Senator Crisco came in here... Uh, I had written the first bunch of questions, and I said to Ethan, I'll ask my questions, you ask your questions. I had the first couple, Ethan had the second couple. And we hit record, and uh, I mean, you see, I've pointed to, well, people can't see, but if someone's off mic, I have to adjust it. And I didn't know what was going on with Senator Crisco, that we had some problems with his headphones. Was he going to wear headphones? Was he not going to wear headphones? Mm. I'm adjusting the, uh, the volume I think we have a problem. I've hit record, and I just said at the like at the very beginning, Ethan, go ahead. And I think <laughs> that was my fault because I just transferred it to Ethan right away. And I think that we just sort of relied on our script from there, and that's why we didn't ask a follow up question. Mm. I think. I mean, uh, I shouldn't make an excuse, but there's a big excuse. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did. You know, I just we, we like we've we've uh, throughout those podcasts we talk about like we don't cover. State we did admit politics that, yeah. Yeah. at all, really. Uh, but since nobody else was doing it, we felt we just figured, obligated to, yeah, to f- yeah. try to fill the void. And I thought, like, um, I thought later I, in the podcast, you know, I thought people like people refer to stuff uh, like you know the sort of parliamentary political process of the the general assembly and it's just you know i don't know all hb 165 yeah, that, we sent that to a committee and that's yeah. you know so i just thought it was one of those and i I, honestly, I think it's pretty clear that you know crisco is associated with malloy and supported those budgets that yeah uh, you know, i actually they, like, thought that, that, that was know. a podcast when it was over and there was a lot of things during that interview where you know we could have you know we could have asked a lot of follow-ups in in all of these interviews but like you said, you, you you like it'll be better if we had both candidates in here at the same time because, you know, if you you sort of if you're aggressive with one person with their answers, and are less aggressive with their opponent or another candidate, you know, you're going to be accused of all and manner just, of things. I um, just had a little less coffee one day or the other. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's. A, I mean, it, the, the whole other. I mean, I, I actually just forgot. Uh, what what I was gonna say. But I actually thought I remember like, after we're, the end you of know, it, we're by no means are we you know perfect and we will make. Yeah, mistakes. it was a mistake. It was a mistake. It wasn't and the I, first time. Won't be the last. Right, so and I yeah, I just you know apologize. The, it, it was it's sort of depressing to me. Uh, I mean, I yeah. called up Jr. Romano and I you know I was like, hey, look, it was, and that's something it was that a mistake. Like, that it infuriates was, me when I'm watching like a national like, right. Meet the Press or something, and Chuck Todd asks somebody a question and they give a, a BS answer or an answer that's less than you know totally whatever. And I'm, I'm like, why don't you ask him? You know, that's something that, yeah. that we've all experienced. Yeah, the follow-up question. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we don't edit them. You know, it's just we, we put it up there. I mean, because the thing was, I listened to it again. Didn't it just didn't jump out at me as I, as I was editing the podcast. And you know, we just cut out the beginning and the end. But yeah, but, but I also think it, of, like if I but were there was so much cam- other stuff yeah. on there. If I were running a campaign I, and there was a know. podcast of my opponent Clearly, they had, for an hour, I would I would listen to it immediately and right. mine it for it all very, sorts yeah, of. Neither oppo. Logan, neither Logan nor Crisco listen to our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but you know, they, you know, eventually they well eventually, after after Kevin listened, Rennie pointed they, it out. Right, it took Rennie the Friday before the election, three weeks after it was up there. Yeah. Yeah, but, you so. know, sometimes that's a slippery slope, too, with something like that, because, you know, why did Senator Crisco not remember his votes? Oh, so, yeah. So sometimes, was, you know, you come across looking uh, inappropriate when you point different things like that out. It's not like I just flat out lied. I don't think it was a case of Senator Crisco flat out lying. Right. I think it was honestly he didn't remember. Um, and I think you need it, to be it, careful with how you attack <laughs> your opponent sometimes because mm. it makes you look... Bad. Yeah. You know, I mean, Donald Trump is the perfect case in point. I mean, he attacks everybody. That's just been his mantra his whole life. And, you know, a lot of times he came across looking extremely bad because of the attack that he took. You know, local elections are very different than um, federal elections because it's more retail politics. You will never see Donald Trump. You will never have Donald Trump at your door. You know, he's not going to knock and say, hi, I'm Donald Trump. I'm running for I'm president. Sure and will bring him here. He was a delegate minutes. at the convention. Well, yeah. I mean, the mayor seems sure to have a very close anytime. personal relationship with the Donald. But <laughs> I think he's um, going to show up here and shut us down. <laughs> <laughs> you too, he just might. But, you know, I think that's the, the difference. Then going back to the point of why wasn't this brought out right away, I think a lot of these campaigns are very focused on the strategy that they put in place. And, you know, we all do messaging and, you know, you sit down in a group of people and, you know, you do the SWAT. So you determine your strengths and weaknesses versus your opponent's strengths and weaknesses. And you ge- gear your mailers and your, you know, your door pieces and all your literature towards that. And the smart campaigns stay on that track and just keep moving forward. And from time to time, when they can veer off, if the opportunity presents itself, I think they will to take a shot at their opponent, but then they need to get right back into that lane and keep mm. moving forward. Campaign successful campaigns should not be free for alls. Mm. They should be extremely organized and extremely regimented to keep the candidate focused and moving in the right direction. To that point, though, I, wasn't I mean not to go back to Donald not Trump to go back to the non-national, but <laughs> wasn't yeah. wasn't an Clinton, anomaly. wasn't Clinton's campaign the most regimented, <laughs> professional in in hi- the history of yeah, a it's just, presidential pol- or you know? But there was the curveballs that. That threw her off, and you know I think it came down. Sometimes it comes down to just who the candidate is. Yeah, I mean, there's no. I, I, to be honest with you, I think the president had the greatest political machine you've ever seen. They were. Well, and in the like, do you there there was a, a graph I think I saw on Twitter that showed, you know, the the Democratic and Republican votes for 08, 12, and sixteen. And it's not that I, I think Trump got fewer votes than Romney did in 2012, slightly. So it's it's not like this but he some wouldn't huge won a lot of those states though. Bigger. Wave, Tur- um, you know, turnout. Clinton just really underperformed yeah. Obama's number, just really underperformed them. Yeah, yeah. And like whether that's a message of how great a candidate Obama was or how terrible Clinton was, or a mix of both. And but and none of us will know. But Trump's style or his strategy. Could have been chaos, cause chaos, and what see is, what I happens. Mean, one thing that that certainly seemed to be to the hit. case. Could have been that. I mean, that could have been the master plan all along that they. It certainly seemed to be came case up in with. the Republican primary where there was such a crowded field. Mm-hmm. That, you know, he already had the lead in name recognition. And it's just yep. sort of be the bull in the china shop and keep all the attention on him. Yeah, and I can't remember you know, who else. Nobody's going to pay Democrats attention to Rand ran. Paul's flat tax plan right. when. Trump is just gutting Jeb Bush every twice a week on right. uh, on the debate stage. Yeah. Uh, but what about, can we talk about your reaction? We'll start with the uh, first select with Miller. Uh, I don't know, maybe you were probably still up when uh, whatever it was, uh, whatever time of night it was when uh, I think the AP... Two two thirty or two ish said or was it, would they call, I think Trump. they called they called Pennsylvania at one thirty. That was basically yeah, the, like was they waited an hour to say you know he has two seventy. But what, what Pennsylvania was, was basically. What, what, I mean, this is a what it feel like. What did you what went through? Uh, it was kind of surreal. You know, it's something we had always you know I had always talked about. But and you voted for him. I should I should uh, ask that. 
so yes. people know. You that originally, in case, in case you don't not know during Kurt the Miller primary. Is. I was a Kasich guy initially. That was, he was kind of more my, you know, my speed. Gotcha. Um, but you know, if this, you know, I'm a representative of the Republican Party, good, bad, or indifferent, and if that's who the people who make up the Republican Party chose to be the candidate for us, I don't believe I'm bigger than the party. So that was the candidate that I voted for. Not that I supported him or agreed with everything that he said. There was no Donald Trump signs on my front lawn. I was not running around giving Donald Trump speeches. But when it comes down to determining who I was going to vote for, I much more aligned with Donald Trump's vision than I did Hillary Clinton's vision. What do you think about Mayor Boughton voting or writing a dog's name in there over in well, Danbury think, Mayor? I think uh, Mayor Boughton corrected that um, and said that he actually voted for Mike Pence. Oh, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, oh, he came back out. I think he was just uh, he was just kidding around. Uh, Mayor Boughton has a very good sense of humor um, and tries to bring a lot of levity to some of these uh, difficult situations. So, Tarek, what was your what was going through your mind? Yeah, when you uh, heard that Donald Trump clinched it. Uh, to um, surreal, like uh, Mr. Miller said. Um, so many. It's been so interesting, actually, the last you know sort of few days trying to unpack uh, you know all of what this means to me personally, and um, you know what's sort of going on in the country as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm spend a little bit of time on this subject if it's all right. But, um, you know, there are times in the past where there would be a candidate that, you know, they'd light up the whole country in terms of, you know, voter turnout. Most notably, Ronald Reagan was probably mm-hmm. the last election where you see pretty much across the board winning, you know, vast majority of the country. Um and this is, a, I think, a little bit of the challenge when it, when I say, you know, sort of partisan politics is that, you know, so there's this sense that at times you default to, you know, your party kind of thing. Um, and I don't know if we'll ever see that again. I don't know if we'll see like a, a Ronald Reagan type of scenario where you, you know, sort of a unanimous decision by the country that this is, you know, the candidate because, you know, he's they he or she speaks to the to the the precise issues that I care about and not necessarily towing the party line. Um, and I should just inter- you you did not vote for Donald Trump. No, I did not vote for Donald Trump. Um, and you know, I, I think it's been such an interesting. It's been su- such an interesting social you know experiment, if you will, to look at this campaign and how it's played out. Um, and to write it off as sort of a, simplif- a simplified one thing or another that, uh, you know, like Kurt Miller was saying, they say that, you know, all Donald Trump supporters are, are bigots or something like that, or, or that his support was driven by that, um, is, is uh, you're, you're overlooking too many of the important factors that, have, that led to his, to his success. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Go ahead. And I, I think ultimately, uh, both the national election and the, the state election um, are driven by the economic reality that we face right now in this country. Um, and that economic reality is different depending on where you are in the country. And going back to that divide between rural and uh, city sociological and economic dynamic, it's very different. And... Um, and, and, and the media doesn't necessarily hone in on that. Right. You know, the, the media makes it sensational. The media makes it a reality show. Um, and, and I'm saying media generally, you guys are you know, great. I would have, I would have, uh, I would have fought that. I would have fought that before this election. I would have, mm. but yeah, I can't defend it. Yeah. But, um, you know, and, and because there, there are genuine fears on both sides and, mm. uh, it's easy to speak to those. It's easy to play those up and i'm not going to say that uh i personally wasn't offended by some of the statements that get made by um you know candidate donald trump and i'm very happy to see that it's starting to tone that down i hope to continue that he continues it with that um to bring people back together and um 
but focusing on sort of the dogma of of those things. I think there's a very small percentage of Donald Trump's base that were motivated by the bigotry of the comments that get made. Very small percentage, I would say. And I think the vast majority of his base are motivated by the economic realities that they face, and they were willing they were willing to overlook mm -hmm. those moral indiscretions of of, yeah. of of his words, because uh, you know you, that you have this perception that you know there's there there's the enemy which is disregarding our economic reality, which is Hillary Clinton, and we all do that. We all we all you know many times when you watch the movies, there are heroes that you know, fly in the face of all of the sort of establishment and, and the powers that be. And, and, and we are willing to tolerate, you know, that portion of them that is a little bit sort of insane um, <laughs> in order to get the bad guy. And, and there was that, that sort of sense of a bad guy for, for those people that voted for Trump. Um, but I think it's important as a nation at this point, and the reason why I came on this show today is to have that dialogue about what is the economic reality that we are facing right now. Um, and if we think that it's as, as simple as waving a magic wand, uh, be it taxes, be it reducing spending, be it, we're, we're totally missing it. And, and to my, in my mind, Donald Trump sp more, spoke to the economic reality of the rural areas of the country better than Hillary Clinton did. Um, he didn't, he, he missed it by far, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the totality of what's going on and what we need to do to address it. But um, he, he came closer to that mark. Um, and I was looking over, you know, after the election, I was looking over his 100 day plan, and there were sort of mm -hmm. like 27 points. And I can tell you, there, half of those I agree with. Right. He's take yeah he's he's yeah. taking mm. things from no he he, he, he ran to the left of Hillary on yeah. trade I mean <clears> it's <throat> amazing and if you look at the the uh, if you do look at the analysis of the counties that flipped from Obama to Trump uh, nationwide there there are the the concentration is in the upper Midwest which you know was gutted by NAFTA the, with the you know the the as the narrative goes. And, and that's that's where the voters flipped from yep. Obama to Trump. So I think that hits the nail on the head uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it, it's not it's not all racist. Or, you know, if, if, if the country were, you know, 51 percent or, you know, half racist, then, you know, we wouldn't be able to get through the day uh, the yeah. way we do. Yeah. And it's not to undermine. It's no less astonishing to me because from my perspective, while I'm saying, yeah, I agree with half of your sort of your economic plan, if you will, or your your plan for the you know, your plan of action. For me, I couldn't get over those those moral mm. indiscretions. I could not move beyond that. I could not move, beyond, I, yeah. could not move yeah. beyond. And that's why ultimately, agree. you know, I could not vote for him because uh, and that's a shame. And, I, and, it, and that's a shame because we need we, do we need somebody to come and shake things up? Absolutely. We do. Absolutely. We do. And, um, you know, I, I, in the primaries, I, I voted for Bernie Sanders. I wish he was the candidate. I think we would have had a different outcome in this election if he was, I because agree. he he spoke more directly to the concerns, not just of he, he was a unifying. He had a unifying sort of vision of what the cha the economic challenges of the country are. And he didn't have the some of the bigotry and the dogma that you know, the baggage of Donald Trump. Um, and, and, it, and again, it's so important. I want to you know, let you know, other people talk a little bit here, but it's so important. I want to oh, come no. back to the to the economic reality of what we're facing right now, and and how we're still missing the mark, and how the the fear of the current economic situation has people grasping for different things right. about what's going on right now. What is going on right now? So I think everyone would agree with. With those statements, it's the economic reality and the uncertainty of it. But you had two candidates that people struggled with personally. Yeah. I mean, I did not like Senator, or excuse me, uh, Secretary Clinton for whatever reason it was. Maybe it was ten years ago, twelve years ago. Something just rubbed me the wrong way about her, 
and there was absolutely no way I was going to vote for her regardless of of what happened. Didn't matter the debates Did, or right, any of didn't that. Matter. Yeah, and I it's, think most people made their mind up. And that's young, the yeah. sad thing. So now you know, you're kind of justifying one candidate over another, not based on ability to lead or ability to govern, but more how do you feel about them. Identity politics. Yeah, yeah. personally. And yeah. you know, to that point, that's why I said I identified a little bit more with Donald Trump's vision of America and how he's going to do things going forward and kind of put the the personal stuff to the side do I agree with what he said absolutely not it was ridiculous the words that come out of his mouth and you know that's the a billionaire that's never been checked before <laughs> never had to be checked before you know one so, thing yeah but to your point though about you know that superhero reference that you made yeah you know Bernie Sanders while I didn't agree with a lot of what he said Bernie Sanders was himself this is me there's no yep. flash there's no it's just what I think this is what I believe and he's going to talk that. I think he would, honestly, he would have won this election by 20 points because yeah, people would yeah. have at least said, that's him. There's no there's yeah. no politics to this. He's just going to say truly what he believes. I think Ethan probably agrees with that. Is there anything you wanted to add, Ethan? Rory Burke's a big uh, Bernie guy. <laughs> just read my face. You know, uh, I, I think... <laughs> no, uh, no, don't read his Facebook yeah. page. <laughs> there, were, there was... Let's can all I just read this, a couple paragraphs from this Thomas Frank uh, thing in The Guardian to that exact point where basically he said... You know, why did they not nominate uh, Bernie? Um, and you just said that, uh, you know, basically it was it was just Democratic insiders being like it's it's Hillary's turn um, to try to put quote to try to put over such a nominee while screaming that the Republican is a right wing monster is to court disbelief. If Trump is a fascist, as liberals often said, Democrats should have put in their strongest player to stop him, not a party hack they'd chosen because it was her turn. Choosing her indicated either the Democrats didn't mean what they said about Trump's riskiness, that their opportunism took precedence over the country's well-being, or maybe both, which is well, why, I, you know, as, as much as I, you know, we, we just talked about the, like the, the drawbacks that, we, you know, forced, like, I couldn't vote for Trump under any circumstances, but, um, you know, a, a lot of that rung hollow with the country because it's like, oh, but, you know, we were... We're putting Clinton up there. So. Yeah, you're willing to overlook it. Yeah. Well, but how is it that the Democratic Party, and to your point that you just made, had three people that wanted to run for president? How was that where you know, the Republicans, we seem to have 714 when it started, <laughs> and it just kind of narrowed itself down? Well, I think there was how definitely, there I think Hillary basically cleared the field in the, in the past few years. You know, But with the talent that's out there and even some of the younger up-and-coming, whether it be senators, congressmen, I mean, there's, I mean, I could recognize there's a lot of good talent on the Democratic side. None of these people wanted to step up, and, and why not? Why would they not want to take a shot at becoming president of the United States? And for it to just be, you know, the secretary and, you know, Senator Sanders and, and you know, Governor O'Malley, I don't understand how that, how that happens. Not everybody wants to go th run through the gauntlet. Well, I guess. true, <laughs> true. And then did true. they want to subject themselves to? I mean, reading the emails that we've we've well, been given access the, to over the past few article, weeks, yeah. you see what what you know people who oppose the uh, the sort of Clinton machine were subjected to, right? And right. Uh, you know, it's it's not pretty, and that's been the case in the Democratic Party for a lot of years now. And like you know, that one good thing that's going to happen is that the you know. You would hope, you know, Howard Dean, of course, is is wants to be the chairman of the DMC, DNC, but uh, I would think that uh, a, a, any rational person who wants the Democrats to win would hope that, like the the Clinton wing of the party, can it's, it's be time to go. shuffled yeah. out of the out of the room. Yeah. You know? How about uh, you know? I just wanted to ask uh, about uh, sort of uh, you know unity and, and where we go. Uh, from here, you know, I was I didn't vote for Donald Trump. Uh, oh, it's three against one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I voted. This is the first I voted since 2000. This is the first time I've ever voted for a major party candidate. And it was like and I've, I've still never voted for a, a winning presidential candidate. Probably <laughs> never will. Um, but I just went. But I'm I'm but an, I'm an unaffiliate. I've, I've, uh, I so became I. a Democrat yeah. to uh, vote for Bernie in the primary oh, just in the even, interest of full transparency. I didn't even know that. OK. But then I, I, I re-registered as an unaffiliated candidate. Yeah, I'm unaffiliated. This is, this is the first election I paid attention to uh, that I read, just was addicted to everything that was yep. happening. And I'm going to go, I'm crawling back under my rock. And uh, it was so nice yesterday on Thursday just to post uh, the Derby High School honor roll. I just felt, I, tell, I took a <laughs> solace in just being like, hey. Yeah, I'm looking at my face. I'm looking forward to my Facebook feed going back to well, kittens and... 
you know, my friend's yeah. kids and but, stuff like that, as opposed to no, but, but, that's boring. You know, wild but, stories on one side or the other. But, but, but I just want to talk briefly about, uh, you know, it, 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 when the when the result came in, I was shocked. I felt like, uh, you know, those polls and how, you know, the media has taken such a, 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 you know, been beaten up so badly, and then to see it sort of, oh, it's it's justified. It made me think that we're in a post uh, media world now, where it's going to be. Uh, the bright Barts and media matters and just mm-hmm. you know partisan uh, news is now here to stay. I feel like Ethan and I already are in a dying industry that might have just. Uh, I feel like that was the last uh, nail in the coffin. I felt irrelevant professionally and sad uh, on a personal yeah, level. Yeah, I, I think it was definitely an indictment of the national news media and the 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 but way I thought, that like, the I presidential thought, races are covered. I think. Yeah, I think I, we do a great job. Yeah, locally. but I just, but I mean, even like I read, like That's the Washington even, Post uh, uh, reporting on on Trump Foundation was probably the best reporting we've seen in years, and it made me think. I mean, my, I personally thought I read that and thought, "Whoa, I could never vote for this guy," but mm. I'm wrong. Uh, but then I thought, "Well, I'm going home tonight, and I have a wife and two kids, and I'll wake up in the morning, and the federal government has no real impact uh, on my life, and whatever." Onward. But I read, I just want to share this, you know, I went to like uh, uh, grade school with this this guy I'm now through Facebook, you know, reconnected to. I don't know him really from a hole in the wall, but we were in second grade together and he posted, uh, my immediate concerns as I go to sleep tonight, living with HIV, I have a pre-existing med- medical condition. With the dismantling of Obamacare, I'll most likely not be, be covered, not be covered if I switch providers. As a gay man, I will lose the right to marry the person I love. My retirement just lost a, just lost a, bleep ton of money uh there are a ton more concerns i mean i'm not saying to address these point by point but i felt like personally i was just dismissing no, how and, people and, are and, feeling and, and, like, and there how is I, how do we get by there, there are people that are legitimately scared and hurt out there uh who aren't in like my little bubble how do we reassure these people and we're seeing protests and i'm seeing on my facebook feed the reaction to some of the protests are just they're just all these millennial cry babies mm. and all that kind of thing, and I don't know—is that are we just going to continue screaming at each other? Uh, and, and not that you know, I mean, protest is protest. Of course, you know, throwing a, a bomb at a cop is not the right thing to do mm. uh, as a son and brother of a cop. Uh, but where do we go? F- you know, where do we go from here? How do we? How? Do, and is Trump going to be the guy that unifies the country? Because one thing that kept me up last night was seeing him accuse the media of inciting uh, protests and I thought to myself oh my god come on man get off Twitter just stop it he had a more measured what I would consider presidential tone in the morning but is this the guy that's going to unify us or am I just a moron for putting politicians on a pedestal and it's thinking politicians are good people and that they aspire to something or like <coughs> what excuse me what, what are we going to do <laughs> well no no <laughs> well I you know <laughs> I should note. I couldn't help that. I'm sorry. I should note the one thing that I, I just wanted to point out real quick too <laughs> is that on on one, about doing those podcasts, it was talk about having your faith restored by having you know everybody running for state office in here. Uh, that was an honor and a pleasure to talk to those people. And you know, I don't feel the way I feel about Donald Trump doesn't transfer to how I encountered them. But but where do we go from here? What, what's going to happen? How do we unify? Uh, uh, the country. I I, th- I think the biggest thing is going to be probably the most important inaugural address in the history of this country. I mean, if he steps up and says the right things, I think that's going to set a tone going forward. I think it's going to take a, a lot of time to heal this country because I agree there are a lot of groups of people out there that, based on what went down in this election and how things went, they should be scared. They should be concerned. Um, but I think we all know that a lot of things that are said in the campaign are sometimes rhetoric. It's sent to, or it's said to kind of drive people to the polls. They hit those buzzwords. So, you know, I, I think that's where it's going to, to come down to, to, to be quite honest with you. But at the same time, and this might get me in a little bit of trouble, um, unfortunately, we live in an everybody gets a trophy society. And we're always extremely concerned about the feelings of the person that came in 163rd. And we need to make sure that that person gets a ribbon or a citation or something. And while I believe people absolutely have the right to protest, and I think that's a great thing for our government, 
you can protest in a very meaningful and peaceful way. You don't necessarily need to be attacking each other. I know it was on the news the other day where a guy, there was a little fender bender. He got out of his car. He got beat up because he was a Trump voter. I know there was another situation on the opposite side. That stuff's got to stop. That's not what America's about. There should be lively debate. There should be lively protest. Nobody's going to agree with everyone all the time. And the only way we're going to heal is if we find those common threads that we all have in common, regardless of Republican, Democrat, Socialist, Independent, whoever you are. There's things that bind us as a country, and we need to get back to that first. And once we do that and we start communicating the proper way to each other, I think that's where it's going to come from. We're never going to agree 100% on everything. It's just it's just not possible. We're too different as people, even within this small town. I mean, right here, four of us, we have differing views of how this election went and who would have been best for the country. Yet the four of us can sit here very peacefully, very respectfully, and have an open discussion back and forth. Why can't that happen in the rest of the country. Now, maybe that's a little pie in the sky. Maybe that's a little naive. But it's going to take the leaders to push Mm. that action. You put, you know, Secretary Clinton and President-elect Trump on a stage together, side by side, and they show that there's now this peaceful, and even bring in President Obama, that there's going to be this peaceful transition of power. I think that's going to help start the process. It's going to take a long time. But we were broken before this election came. I think just just kind of pushed us over over the edge. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree with all of those points, and I think that um, I think that it is important. However, uh, just as as important it is to understand uh, for people who voted for Trump that it was not necessarily driven. Understand their their reality. Understand their economic reality. And I think it's important for us as a country to understand that for the people who were the target of some of the bigot, bigoted rhetoric from Donald Trump, that this his election and his candidacy was a traumatic experience. Uh, and that's genuine. That's real. Um, I can t- I can say that from personal experience. I, I felt that, um, you know, sort of I grew up in a household where uh, my mother was Catholic and my father was Muslim um, and uh, I would not, if, if, if Donald Trump makes good on his promise to ban Muslims from coming into the country, and if he was, if he was here in 1970 when my father immigrated to this country, I would not be here today mm-hmm. if President Donald Trump was in office with those policies at oh. that time. Um, and it, it's a good point, and it's something I, I, I sort of I, I've thought about. I've talked with my wife about this. Is I, okay, what is, where do we go from here? Um, you know, can we can we unify as a country um, for the people that have been the target of this rhetoric? I was kind of you know thinking about. It. I said, you know, it kind of reminds me of like an abusive relationship. Anybody who's ever experienced that uh, firsthand, or uh, from a friend or a loved one, um, you know, you have somebody that that sort of assaults you verbally or or, or physically, and if they've been in a, in a long term relationship usually they stay because it's uh because there's good that's happening in that relationship too right um can the people of this country who felt like they were the target of this rhetoric ever come to a moment let's say he drops or donald trump drops this kind of rhetoric and he fo- and he's and let's give him the benefit to say that he'll be successful in accomplishing those things that will genuinely help the economic circumstances of the country can the people that feel like they were the victims of those of that rhetoric ever feel proud of a Donald Trump? How much time has to pass? Three years? How much good has to happen? If they're, you know, how much uh, beneficial economic activity before you can forgive the means that were utilized to put you into that position? Um, and I think opening up that forum. And I think every single person in this country has a responsibility to engage in that fashion and open up that forum so that we can talk about the real critical issues. This is, we can't, we're not going to survive if we have to go through another 50 years of identity politics. Mm -hmm. We're not. Our system will break. Um, And if there is not a genuine and coordinated effort 
to to support open nonpartisan forums to talk about why we come together as a people. Why do we have a government? What you know? What's the what is the point of collective action at the very basic level? And there is an enormous amount, an enormous amount of overlap when it comes to the issues. And that's what's amazing. And that's the, that's the going back to the destructive nature of partisan politics. If you were to poll people on the issues, psh, people agree about 99% of what needs to be done in this country. I agree with that. Hmm. Um, and it's, it, it's the, the destructive nature of, of, of party politics is to say, I'm, I'm a Republican, it's a brand. A Democrat, it's a brand. And then we would say, okay, I'm a Democrat. What does that mean? You know, so if, some, if I tell somebody I'm a Democrat, it says, okay, you're, uh, you're pro-choice, you're uh, anti-gun, um, you're in favor of welfare programs, you believe that the government has an, has an active role to play in the economy. Okay, uh, those are all, you know, I think fair assumptions of what is, uh, you know, the sort of brand of the Democratic Party. The Republican Party, you might say, okay, you're pro-gun. You uh, believe that the government has a lim very limited role to play in the um, in, in economic activity, and you would say that you are uh, pro-life. And you may we make all these assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. But the majority of people are right smack in the middle, yep. and we need to find that common ground. We need to have an un an unpartisanly charged conversation on those issues and um i know we're, we're, we're running out of time i'd really like to be able to talk just a moment about how i view the economic reality of what we're facing right now is that all right yeah no yeah, no yeah. well if i can just you know yeah. follow up your point i think both parties are pulled by the extremes within the party i think you know the republicans are pulled to the extreme right and i think the democrats are pulled to the extreme left I think the vast majority of the people in this country are fiscally conservative and socially very tolerant. That's I think right. That's, that's just right. where we are. Yeah. Um, and until we can get a candidate that can essentially walk that course and get either the Republican nomination or the Democratic nomination, I think we're going to continue to have these problems because to get the Republican nomination, you have to go so far right, and the Democratic nomination, you have to go so far left. There's really no coming back because once you say it, you can't. You can't bring it back. So I think your point was spot on. The country is in the middle. The political parties are on either side. Yeah. And sometimes you're choosing the lesser of, of two evils. So. Okay. Yeah. And going. This, yeah. I don't mean to, to rush it, but it's been about an hour five. He so. does that a lot. <laughs> he didn't get to talk a lot, so now he wants to rush us it's along. supposed to be a 54 minute. I, I, uh, WNHH is ready to... Uh, they cut us off 20 minutes ago. This is the internet. Let's yeah, let them go for 20 yeah. minutes. I'm on board. <laughs> All right. All right. I got a contract for two hours this month. I just got Valley a text from my wife. All right. <laughs> I know you got to... I won't be too... I think it's important, okay, because we see... I think we often see, and we... People are are struggling ec economically, and to differing to differing degrees. And I think it's important to understand, uh, you know, what 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 is, in my opinion, what's going on. And I think, you know, going back over the last 20 years, we've seen a perfect storm of economic challenges. You've got the 2008 uh, recession, the crisis in 2008. And if you, to put that in perspective, I don't think people quite understand how significant the 2008 recession is. It took 10 years from the, the 1929 crash. It took a new deal from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and it took World War II to bring us out of that. 10 years. And we're only, we're eight years on from that. And we didn't have World War II, and we don't <laughs> have a new deal. We had TARP, but relative to the size of what, you know, the proportion of what the New Deal was relative to the size of the ec economy back then, TARP and, and the American Recovery Investment Act was nothing. You have, at the same time, you have an impact of, of globalization and trade. So you see the manufacturing sector getting just walloped, okay? So you see, you know, sort of NAFTA and you see these different, you know, it becomes more economically efficient as a business, as a prudent business owner 
you know, the market's telling you to do this, you got to go overseas and, and offshore. At the same time, and this is the biggest one, and this is the one that nobody's talking about, and this is the, the, the elephant in the room. And it's a conversation that I think everybody needs to have. I want to see politicians starting to talk about this on a major level because it's going to challenge us as a people across the world on a scale that we, I don't think we've ever really seen before. Philosophically, how we organize ourselves, economically, how we organize ourselves, which is automation and technology. More so than outsourcing and, 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 and globalization, the automation that we're seeing uh, in, in, in the productive process as a, as a factor of production is becoming so substantial that it's worth now starting to spend some time thinking about what does a world look like where the majority in, of goods and services that we consume are brought with very little human, imp human input. Mm. We're not far away from that. We're very close. And if you look through the history of automation through every major sector of the economy, you know, 1700s, you have a situation where you know, 99% of the, of the population is, is occupied through agriculture. And then comes the cotton gin and the mechanization of farming. And you have a generation of people that get displaced. And then eventually, you know, manufacturing comes in, industrial, industrial revolution comes in. And people now are, the next generation are now trained up and absorbed into the manufacturing sector. And then in comes automation and, 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 uh, and technology into the manufacturing sector. And you see, again, a major displacement in, uh, in, in, in a generational displacement of people that were involved and in, 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 uh, employed by the factories. Now it's coming to services. Okay, now you've got sophisticated software and sophisticated robotics and technology that will prepare your taxes. They will trade your stocks. Mm -hmm. They will m manage your finances. They will drive your cars. Now we have to say, and, and it's not far off, and, and, and as you know, the, the Moore's Law applies to software, we're seeing exponential improvement in terms of the things that we never thought could be automated. And we need to say, and, 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 and this plays out in the, we're seeing a con because of these things, because of the Im Im increasing importance of capital in our, in, in our economic production, the owners of capital reap enormous rewards. And that's why we're seeing a, a huge concentration of wealth. And we're seeing a concentration of wealth on, uh, on an individual basis. We're seeing a concentration of wealth from the business side. And we're seeing a concentration of wealth on the city side. Okay, I have such an interesting uh, little chart here. It shows from 1992 to 1996, the cities with over a million people represented 13% of the net new business creation. Jump ahead to 2010 to 2014, 58%. Mm. 58% of all new net new businesses being created in cities with over a million people. And you see the concentration, you see this kind of market concentration in the businesses. You see company that it used to be that if you were the number one player in your industry, yes, you had the largest share, but you didn't have all of it. And now what we're seeing is you see, take a company like Facebook, for example, okay? You'd see yeah. what market share they have in social media. Yeah. 60%. The next one down, Twitter, 2%. So you see these concentration, you see this concentration of market share, you see this concentration of wealth. And if we don't talk about this, and if we don't understand what that means in terms of the equitable, equitable distribution of the, the product and the value that's being created by all these machines, we're going to be in trouble. And we're going to see a lot more of you know, the, the sort of craziness and the lashing out. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that if you don't pay attention to it, it bubbles out in ugly ways. Mm -hmm. And we need to have that kind of conversation to say, 
you know, what does this look like? How do we want to occupy ourselves? Are we, are we considering the notion of a universal basic income and these kinds of things as a redistribution mechanism to account for the fact that you have this concentration going on across so many different platforms here? You know, how do we, how do we position ourselves, um, you know, to succeed as a nation? Or are we just going to resolve to be, uh, you know, a sort of country of, uh, you know, city or corporate, um, you know, fiefdoms? Okay, and I didn't mean to cut you short there. He but does that to me all the time. We are yeah. at a get used to it. An hour, so I'll probably put that part in its own, like a bonus little. Hey, I just got a podcast. breaking news thing. Like not that Bill I want to overtime. Not that I want to cut you <laughs> off, but uh, Mike Pence takes over Trump transition team. There you go. Huh. So yeah, that's uh, it. Had been Chris Christie, whose correct. star has fallen recently. Well, perhaps um, he's in but line that, for I mean, cabinet that's post. People, people say like we should oh, impeach no. Trump or whatever, but it's like but the Pence is an insurance policy against that. He's he's to the right of Trump. I mean, oh, so, he's to the right of uh, he, he, yeah. <laughs> to the right of Mars. Chris Christie. All right, hey, th- I, I want to thank uh, Tarek Raslin and Seymour First Selectman Kurt Miller for. Uh, coming on uh, this podcast. I think this is the most uh, informative podcast that we've ever done. This is a really good conversation. I think we should have a regular spot, the two of us. <laughs> I'm, and I'm wondering if you two are even necessary. <laughs> and I don't mean so that in a bad so way, the but country, just give us a regular, just a regular spot. The two of us will come in here and just talk for an hour. I got to go uh, post some memes on <laughs> Facebook. All right, guys? <laughs> All right, this is Eugene Driscoll for Ethan Fry. Yo. <laughs> Saying see you next week. Later. Maybe. Thank you very much. <laughs>